Good evening, everyone. I'm Kelly Wright, and this is America's Hope. We hope that wherever you are, you're safe and well, taking care of yourself and your family because you matter. And the reason why we'd like to tell you that is because it's true. You matter, especially to those of us here at America's Hope. And we're hoping that in tonight's program, you'll be filled with hope no matter what you're going through. Because tonight we're going to focus on the secrets to answered prayers with John Tesh. We're also going to hear from Alan Powell, who is the producer of the new musical, and it's on your screens. It's the movie called Journey to Bethlehem. And then we're going to talk to a young man who aspires to be a successful Broadway producer. And he's doing that, and he'll talk about his One in a Million musical. His name is Kevin Davis. He'll be joining us. So let's get started. But it is the holiday season, and I could truthfully say Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, all of that good stuff. But really, what brings it home is the power of film. And we've got a great film to talk about today. The film is called Journey to Bethlehem. It's a captivating musical film starring the legendary Antonio Banderas. And this film promises to transport audiences on an unforgettable journey to the biblical city of Bethlehem. This child is the chosen one. Sony, a firm, released it worldwide, and alongside uh, his producing endeavors right now is Alan Powell. This is one of many things that you produce, Alan. I gotta thank you for producing this particular film. I can't wait to see it, but tell, tell us about it, your cast, your crew, and why you decided to do this magnificent film. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show, Kelly. It's an honor to, to be here. And we are, we're very, very excited about this film, uh, Journey to Bethlehem. This is a story, the story of Mary and Joseph and the birth of Christ is one that means so much to us, all of us as filmmakers. I produced the film, I write a director, uh, Adam Anders. Uh, it's a story that's, that's close to him and one that, we, that we're passionate about. And it's quite frankly, it's an honor and it's exciting for us to be able to make this and deliver it hopefully to you know the entire world, people who love this story, who celebrate Christmas and celebrate the reason for the season, which is Jesus and his birth so many years ago, and to be able to bring it to life in what we think is a new, fun, fresh way um, through musical and through diving into these characters that we love so much and know so much about uh, is, is something that we are, we're honored to do, we're excited to be able to have done, and we're really hopeful that it brings joy and and to quote uh your show hope uh to everyone this holiday season and our hope is that people who who love this story and celebrate this story with their families every year will be encouraged um by this film and will have a new way to celebrate the christmas season to celebrate christ's birth with their families you know something that's yeah. fun for the young for the young kids and truthfully for for, for all of us but also something that's meaningful and we see these characters wrestle with this, this impossible burden that God has called them to do in a way that can encourage us as believers uh, when God calls us to do things and we wrestle with that and how do we do it? This is too big for me. And can I really step out in faith in this way? We tried to put all of that in um, so that there's something for, for everyone. I have six kids myself. And so for me to make a movie uh, that my kids all the way down to my two-year-old and up to my 13-year-old, that there was something for everybody in this movie and then something that my wife and I as well could sit and watch and be encouraged by and be challenged by was something that we set out to do. And what do you say to your children in order to mm. let this film bring some hope and faith and love to not only them, but our children's children and this world in its current form of darkness? How do you shine the light? Um, I, I would venture to say that's what you and the cast and crew uh, had in mind, uh, not realizing that uh, a war would break out in Israel, not realizing that there would be protests in the streets. Um, so this film uh, comes at a very, very important time, would you say? Oh, absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head, quite frankly, when you talked about what we're what we're hoping will happen um, right now. There's there's so much division, truthfully, among believers. Uh, there's certainly division in the world in general, um, and we hope that we that we're delivering something that can remind all of us, definitely our children, but really all of us, where hope really comes from. 
where love really comes from. And that is the introduction of this incredible savior into our existence, you know, which happened thousands of years ago in a way that God offered us this beautiful reminder that he loves us, that he cares about us so much that he's willing to reach through reality and reach through existence and give us um, a reason uh, to be hopeful. Yeah, you know, Alan, I want you to stay with me for uh, another segment, please, if you don't mind. We'll take a slight break and come back with more of America. So. Mary, you are to be the mother to a savior and king. And you're watching right there a new film that's called Journey to Bethlehem, and what a what a story that it tells, the greatest story ever told. I uh, guarantee you uh, to go out and watch this. You will not be disappointed because you will walk back and have a lot of discussions with your family about this wonderful story as told mm -hmm. through so many people in musical form. And the gentleman who's really uh, intimately and intricately involved in that is Alan Powell. He's the producer of the uh, film. And, and Alan, uh, I, I got to ask you, you, you're a talented actor, you're a writer, you've done, and a musician, you've done so much. Did you ever see yourself getting into this space that you would tell the story uh, of Jesus Christ and the birth and the journey to Bethlehem? The short answer is no, Kelly. Um, we have no idea what God has for us. And I gotta be honest with you, the first time that I spoke to Adam, who's the writer director of this movie, the thing that stuck with me, and the reason that I knew that for the next, what would turn out to be 10 years of my life, I wanted to do whatever it took to get this movie made, was he told me that he wanted to tell, you know, a fun family movie about Mary and Joseph and the birth of Christ, great. But the ultimate theme that he wanted to deliver was that through Mary, this idea that God has bigger plans for you than you could ever have for yourself is one that I would give anything to be a part of, of telling. Because I know that it's been true for me. So to your point, no, I never thought that I had the opportunity to be here talking to you about this and doing this because I didn't have that plan. But I do believe that God's plans for us are so much bigger than we could plan for ourselves, yeah. and I'm truthfully, I'm living proof of it, being here on this show with you talking about this movie that I don't know how we got it made. Like, I don't know how we did it, but I'm so grateful that we did. And I know that uh, God's capable of doing anything. And uh, and that's yeah. that's this is really a testament to that. And where can people see this important film uh, that's a musical and, and yet it, it has a great, uh, Great cast, Antonio Banderas. I, I know that Lecrae is in it. You've got some other uh, wonderful people who are noteworthy in music. Uh, this is a great, great cast you've got. It's, we're so excited and honored that these incredible artists came to play in these roles. Fiona Paloma plays Mary, who does so beautifully and with such reverence to take on, I mean, one of the most iconic characters and one of the most iconic people to have ever lived. Milo Mannheim is unbelievably charming and, and deep as Joseph. Uh, Joel Smallbone, who from the band for King and Country that many of your viewers may know of, um, plays a character named Antipotter um, for us, who we, in, in a way, you have to see the movie is the first convert, if you will, to Christianity. Um, not to spoil it, but to spoil it a little bit. Yes, and then Antonio Banderas plays Herod for us in such a fun, uh, terrifying way, and Lecrae is incredible. 
as uh, as the angel Gabriel, the cast that came together, we couldn't be more proud of um, and honored to have these these great artists come come and, and play in the sandbox with us, uh, as we say. But I'm excited to say, Kelly, that uh, you can go see the movie in your theater right now, all around the country, anywhere you want to watch a movie, you can go and you can buy tickets and you go see this film. And that in and of itself is kind of surreal for me to be able to say, but I am grateful to our partners at Sony and Affirm to, so, to have helped us. Absolutely, and post it on social media, everybody. This is good stuff that you can post. So look, before I, before I let you go, I gotta ask my final question, which I ask all of our guests, because to me, it's near and dear. Uh, first of all, thank you for being on the program. Just love what you're doing. Don't Happy be a stranger. Be Come Happy on back anytime. And, and the fact that you're doing music, and I love music, we gotta talk in the future. But the bottom line is, uh, congratulations on this film. I pray that it will be extremely successful, particularly in the hearts and minds of people who watch it. Uh, so my final question is, what is your hope for America? Oh, wow, what a question. Hang on, I gotta take it in. Um, my hope for America is that we will remember that we are all infinitely valuable. You know, this movie Journey to Bethlehem is about God reaching through existence and giving us his son. And I believe that he gave us his son for everyone. And he did that because we all are infinitely valuable and in his mind are worth it. And my hope for America is that we'll remember that. We'll remember that about ourselves. That we won't doubt ourselves. We won't treat ourselves poorly. Um, and that we'll remember that about each other. You know, every time one of my kids hits one of my other kids, I sit them down, I look them in the eye and I say, you don't get to hit my kid. But I also say, but you know, I wouldn't let anybody hit you either. Hmm. And my hope for America is that we'll remember that we are infinitely valuable to God. Your neighbor is, and you are. And I think if we can remember that, hope if we can remember that, that the divisiveness will subside, that the unkindness will go away. We're not gonna always agree, for sure. That's never gonna change either. But we can be kind to one another. We can listen, we can seek to understand, we can have empathy because that person across the aisle, that person across the table, that person across the conversation deserves it because God said so, yeah. because we are his. I hope that we as a country remember that. In God we trust my friend, much love to you brother. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Alan. Thank Powell. you. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for letting me be here. Oh, yeah. Our pleasure. Journey to Bethlehem. Thank you, Alan. God bless you. Coming up next, we'll be talking to a man who aspires to be a successful Broadway producer. Kevin Davis is up next. Welcome back to America's Hope. And joining me now is Kevin Davis. He's an award-winning African-American composer, director, playwright, and jazz musician. I've actually heard him play before, and he's very good. Kevin, thanks for being on the program. Welcome to America's Hope. Thank you, Kelly. I'm so happy to be here, uh, to be in the studio with you, um, and I appreciate you bringing me in. Oh, man, my pleasure. Uh, look, I, I, I knew that you were out there working very hard as a as a, a, a man aspiring to do the great way on Broadway, and, and certainly you've had a Broadway musical. Let's talk about that. Uh, it's an off-Broadway musical that you've been doing for a number of years now. Uh, what's it called and, and what's happening with it? Well, there are a couple of things, projects we have on the table. Um, I think the one that you're referring to is One in a Million Musical. Um, that one is near and dear to my heart. They all are. But this particular show is near and dear to my heart because it's so apropos for what I think our nation is going through right now. Uh, I always want to tell good stories, Kelly, but I always want to tell good stories that matter, good stories that uplift people, uh, good stories that make room for faith, um, and just good real stories about real people that anybody can enjoy. And given the climate of our country, the what's, what makes this story so special now, it really deals with what happens when a church or community or a country can no longer agree on anything. Mm. And the consequences of not being able to agree on anything. Now we do it with humor. We do oh, it yeah. with, with comedy. Yeah. We do it through 
uh, a group of, group of people who can't agree on how they should spend their lottery winnings. But that's all, <laughs> that's all an allegory. What we're really talking about is the fact that America as a nation can't agree on anything. Wow. And what will happen if we don't realize that we have much more in common than we have, have, have a difference with. I like how you use that as an allegory to talk about uh, what's happening with families, what's happening with individuals, what's happening with government, what's happening with us as a nation and thereby the world, uh, where we seem to have this fractious divide that continues has become very toxic. So in your, in your production, how do you find the, the answer and the solution to break through the, div the divisiveness that we go through? That's a great question, and basically we, we have, we start out with a cast of people that should be, should, should have unity. They all are in the same community. In fact, they all go to the same church. Wow. Any, any, any church uh, USA, but it's a very diverse church. We have black people, we have white people, we have an Indian person, we have Hispanic people. In fact, the two lead women in the show are two Hispanic sisters. And that was intentional on my part, because I, I, I want everybody to come to the party. But as often as the case, money will divide people. And as they can't figure out how to, how to spend their money, how are we going to come to a, uh, how, how are we gonna get them all back together? Well, there's one young girl in the cast, and she's the youngest member of the cast, a person that the older ones dismiss. She's too young to know anything, but she's kind of the one who has the most faith, shall we say. And while they fall apart, she really doesn't fall apart. Her, she is consistent in knowing where to go, what to do, and how to solve this problem, and how to bring them back together. And her, her commitment to faith is one that is, is, is a universal commitment to faith. What I mean by that is, we want people to make room in their lives for faith. When things fall apart, and life is like that. In your life, things are gonna fall apart. You know, I know it's, uh, it's, it's been produced and, and you've presented it numerous times. You have some people from Broadway who are actually looking into helping with this. And then you're also doing some work with uh, Broadway uh, producers, one of them being a Tony winner. Uh, so what's next for One in a Million and what's next for your other productions? Oh, let's see. Well, uh, in terms of One in a Million, we were very fortunate. We did have some Broadway people come down and, and look at it. Um, they've, they've, they've liked it. They, I've even, I even got a little bit of financial support from, from, from one of them. Uh, perhaps there'll be more in the, f in the future. We'll, we definitely need more financial support. Um, a, producer's job. a producer's we job. We are always asking for money. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you have a friend who's a producer, look out. <laughs> yeah. He's always asking for money. But seriously, um, uh, so we, we have some uh, very good Broadway folks who, are, who have been uh, supportive of us. And we still have some ongoing discussions and meetings with them. Uh, hopefully, you know, that will lead to a full-blown yeah. uh, Broadway production. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you is that you talked about, you've, t you've spoken a lot about faith tonight and the fact that you wanted to produce musicals that exemplify and, and, and actually put a focus on faith and on hope and on love. And you're, you're talking about the fact that America is divided and needs that. I, I find that commendable because a lot of young artists today um, they're not always doing that. Uh, and, I, and then I've spoken to some young artists and, and even older artists who are on fire for, for lifting people up. Do you find that there's some resistance? I mean, you talked about the fact that a lot of Broadway people want to see your play and make it to Broadway. But do you find that there's still some resistance out there to the messaging of hope and faith and love that you're showing in your musical? Absolutely. Why does that, ex why does that exist? I think people are scared of things they don't understand. Oh, well, what's, what's think, there to understand about hope and faith and love? <laughs> be, be, you know, what's, what is challenging for people is they're getting so many messages. Good point. They're getting so many messages, and a lot of these messages that they're getting are not accurate messages. 
the false narratives. They're getting tons of false narratives. So they really don't understand that they too have faith even if they haven't quite realized it yet. I'll give you an example of what I mean. I tell my actors, I said, if you're in theater, if you're in movies, if you're in TV, you have to have faith in something mm. because there's no guarantee you're going to make it. Mm. There's no guarantee that show is not going to be canceled. Say that. You know, yeah. there, there's no guarantee that if you're a Hollywood star today, tomorrow no one will know your name. Yeah. So you actually have faith in things that you can't see. So it sounds to me like you're shining the light on the darkness that's out there. One of, one of the questions I like to ask all of, uh, of my guests on this show, uh, since it's about hope and we call it America's hope, what's your hope for America? That's a great question. I hope I don't get emotional. I love America. I'm an American. I see a nation that's literally coming apart at the seams. I see a nation where people can't talk to each other anymore. I see one statement you make could be totally taken out of context and misconstrued. I want to see an America where we can talk to each other again, where we can help each other again, where we can live together as Americans, all of us. America, we the people, has to be all of us. If it's not all of us, then it's none of us. I want to see an America where, where the diversity of Americans is embraced and not fought about. Oh man, I, I, I want to see an America where, where, commun where c each community will be willing to help people in the community. I want to see an America where churches preach the truth, the whole gospel. If American churches were really preaching the whole gospel, Kevin Davis speaking, we'd be in a much better place <laughs> instead of pieces of it. We like to pick and choose. Yeah. And I'm, I, I'm, it's, it's all there. It's all there. It's not there to pick and choose. There is a balance, but it's all there. And it is about faith, hope, and love at the end of the day. And out of that comes forgiveness and reconciliation, restoration, and transformation. Kevin, thanks for being on the program tonight. Thanks for having me. I Kevin so appreciate Davis, it. I wish you, oh, I pray for you to have uh, your success come true with uh, your productions. Thank you. He's Kevin Davis. Coming up next, we've got a man who talks about the power of hope and the power of prayer. His name is John Tesh. That's next. Welcome back to America's Hope. One man who exemplifies hope is John Tesh. Now, do I need to do a formal introduction to most Americans? No, because most of you know that John Tesh is the talented, multi-talented uh, writer, composer, uh, going back to entertainment tonight. He's an anchor, reporter, and he's just an all-around nice guy, and he joins us right now on America's Hope. And John, you're here to talk about something new that you're doing, and yet it's something that's really new but old because it talks about the power of prayer. Welcome to the program, my friend. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks. It's great to see you again. And you talk about uh, whether people remember me. I, I get people at Starbucks all the time that come up, <clears throat> come up and say, didn't you used to be John Tesh? And I'm like... Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't and know did I did I that. mention that he still has a great sense of humor? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you you yeah, you don't survive without it. Uh, you know, you know, in 2015, I was uh, diagnosed with a rare form of prostate cancer, and the doctor said, you know, we're not really operating on cancer that's this severe and they say I said, how much time do I have and it was like 18 months to two years I was like whack so my wife Connie you know Connie Selica my yeah, wife Connie and, Selica uh, she and I or I, I just I became a cancer patient basically I, I talked like a cancer patient I you know I just completely obliterated Proverbs 1821 death and life are in the power of the tongue <clears throat> I was speaking death over myself because I just ah, I'm 63 I've done some stuff you know I got a couple of grandkids this is uh, so I'm done and Connie just sort of rose up, you know, from Italian from the Bronx and just said, no, this is not us. And so uh, long story short, we, we relied on the doctors, but we also landed 
we landed in the world of uh, of healing prayer, and we and you know I've lived in the Bible like you for my whole life, but I had missed Mark eleven twenty three, which mm. is you know whoever says to this mountain be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart but believes that what he says will be done. I shall have whatever he says. Therefore, whatever you ask when you pray, believe that you're already receiving it. I'm thinking, that's Jesus talking. Yeah. And so we, we started digging in and our friends at Karis Bible who teach, uh, who teach healing uh, prayer. And, and, and that enabled me to, as you mentioned, to have hope and to be able to visualize the future that God wanted for me. And it, it took a lot of renewing of the mind, uh, especially when you're going through chemo, but, uh, but I got on the other side of it. You know, I like what you how you unpack that and going a little bit deeper it took a little renewing of the mind which means as you stated before you were talking uh the power of death as opposed to the power of life uh, through the power of the tongue talk to me about that because now you're making it available so that all can learn just like you learn and by the way isn't god good because you're alive and well to tell this good news story in a bad news world yeah, amen. And um, yeah, the renewing of the mind is not easy, but what? But uh, when you get there, all of a sudden you have a, what's known as a huge paradigm shift. So what happened was, and we still do 20 concerts or so a year, and at the end of it, I give my testimony. And so at the end of the of the shows, you know, all of a sudden you, you're you're talking to in the lobby, you're talking to 100 people who are sick or are fighting sickness. And so there were a lot of questions like, what prayers did you use? What was your what was your process? How did you visualize yourself? Uh, you know, healed. What did God have to say about what you were going through? So I just said, why don't I just create a bunch of videos uh, so that people can get that? And and so we call it the Secrets to Answered Prayers. And it's uh, you know, it's really great about about digital learning now is you can create a course. And so we created that course, and then all of a sudden people are like, well, how do I need to learn how to apply it? And so we also do a, a, a like a coaching community, a healing coaching community. And, and, and when people, when you get into a community of like-minded people and you're praying for each other, it's, it's, it's supernatural. You, you know what I like about this, John, is that, uh, look, there are, there are courses on how to cook, courses on how to take care of your pets, courses on how to dress, courses on etiquette, but a course on prayer to teach us to pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Uh, that's important, and you you already have two million social uh, media followers, but you're expanding that now, giving something people that I believe they really need. They because people are hungry and thirsty for hope, and and certainly with what you've been through and to share that experience in a transparent and and humble way, uh, thank you for doing that. First of all, uh, because there are a lot of people who need it. Or what kind of feedback are you getting? The feedback has been great. Before we even decided to do this, I went and I polled, you know, because you can do this now. I, I polled like our two million Facebook uh, fans. Uh, also, we have a you know a big uh, you know, email list, and also on the radio show, which reaches millions of people. We just said, hey, if I could teach you one thing based on my experience, what would that be? Or, or what's what are you going through right now? What's the one what's the one challenge you're 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 facing? And we started with multiple choice, and then and then people started writing in. And what's, what happened was there were a lot of people who, who, have, uh, who are lonely, especially, so our audience is, uh, is, is 50 plus, right? So I'm a baby boomer, I was born in 1952. So there's a bunch of us, right? And a bunch of baby boomers are now feeling uh, disenfranchised because it's like, okay, so I'm looking for the second, the next chapter in my life. I retired or I wanna come out of retirement or I took care of my parents or I'm taking care of my parents and my kids at the same time. I, I, need a, I need to hit the restart button. How can people get a hold of this? The easiest way is really just to go to uh, mylastname.com, which is just Tesh, T-E-S-H dot com, uh, and you'll see it. And you'll also see testimonials there because, you know, there are people who have been profoundly affected. I, a lot of what people are saying, and I didn't expect this, is that they're going through the course four or five times. And so the more, the more we, depending on what situation we're in, the more we recapitulate the learning, uh, and understanding what's in the Bible, then, 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 then the better it is for, you know, for what our challenges are. So yeah, so Tesh.com is the best place to find that. What was the breakthrough that enabled you to keep, to keep rising and, and not look over to your left or to your right to keep your eyes focused on the prize of giving people hope? I won't, I won't lie to you. When I, when I, got, uh, when I became a cancer patient, as I said earlier, 
Um, I started, I, I knew my life was, I, I knew, I thought intellectually that my life was, uh, was over from, from the, you know, what the doctors had said to me. And so I started drinking really heavily and then I was mm -hmm. in so much pain and I started taking Vicodin. And, uh, and when you're a cancer patient, or at least in my situation, you can pretty much get anything you want. You can go, you can go to what they'll take you, your family will take you to any resort. They'll, your doctor will give you whatever you want. And I became a very selfish person. And so in this studio, uh, it was about five years ago, uh, my wife and I were toe to toe and we were arguing and she was just saying, you're destroying this family, you're destroying your own life. And uh, I'm not going to stand up for you anymore if you won't stand up for yourself. And that was a real turning point, uh, not only in our relationship, but also in, in my life, understanding that the pity party had to be had to be over. You can't do it by yourself. You know? Oh, my God. Oh, my goodness. That's uh, look, that's that's uh, that that right there. You got to me. That's that's you're making me feel emotional. It's it's wonderful to have a you know, that uh, help me like that, a, a best friend, a wife who's right there by your side and uh, helping you through it. That's a, that's a Proverbs 31 woman you got right there, my friend. For people to understand Proverbs 31, go look it up. You'll, you'll appreciate what, yeah, what, yeah, what sure. John uh, just said. Uh, and, and really that leads me to my next point, uh, because you talk about Jeremiah 29, 11, which of course is uh, where God is telling the, the, the Jewish people, my plans for you are not for disaster, but for a future and a hope. And it seems like Connie had to remind you, look, John, uh, the cancer is not a death sentence. It's not for disaster. But even though you're gonna go through this, God is saying, I've got a plan for you, John. It's gonna be for a future and a hope. And you'll be able to share that with the entire world. Talk to me about that, brother, please. Yeah, yeah. You know, grief can be as powerful, a loss of a loved one or you know, going through, you know, what we're going through as a, as a nation right now, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a, a chemo. It can be grief. It can be rumination. It can be depression. It can be just be being stuck, being lonely. You know, all of it has the same effect as, uh, as, uh, you know, as having, having chemo in your veins, you know, and mm -hmm. the, the, I, I wanted to answer the, the question that you asked, cause I didn't really do it properly, which is, you know, uh, I used to try to sh share my faith uh, in, in, during concerts, and it, we got a lot of pushback from people who were like, you know, I didn't pay for this, and, and it's interesting, but do I really need to hear this? And I, I don't believe that God put sickness on me for me to have a ministry, but there's something very different when you're on stage and you play like 15 songs, and then all of a sudden it's like, let me just tell you uh, why I'm so grateful to be here with you playing music right now. And then with pictures of me, you know, in the hospital with pictures of me with my with my wife and then and then and then reading scripture while I'm playing piano on, you know, on on stage. And then all of a sudden you don't even have to be going to church. You don't have to be a Christian. You can just look at that and say, OK, so if this guy, this goofy guy who used to read the celebrity birthdays on Entertainment Tonight now has a music <laughs> career and he almost died and he got through it, I should probably just take a look and see if I can't use some of this stuff. You know, so that's really where I am. So let's talk about your tour. Uh, talk to me about the tour and, and what that's like, aside from your daughter telling you how is your audience going to <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, it's 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 a fun. Sh if I do say so myself, it's a fun and goofy show. We get the audience very involved. Um, you know, I have had a, a, a as, as you know, because we've known each other for a while. I have I've had a varied career. You know, I've worked, I've worked on the Olympic Games as an announcer and as a composer. I wrote a basketball theme for the you know for, for the NBA. horse jumping and Mr. Universe. Um, I, I, you know, I worked for entertainment tonight and I was a local news reporter at CBS in, in New York with John Stossel and, and Meredith Vieira. And so there's a lot of weird, different stuff uh, that I've done. But when we go out and we do these concerts, there's a, that we, we bring a big screen with us, right? And so a lot of what we're doing is uh, on stage is we're synced up to video. So it might be me, you know, uh, re uh, recording the music for Howie Mandel's 
a cartoon show, Bobby's World, or something, yeah. and, and we yeah. and we sync up to that, or, or an Olympic performance. Um, now this, of course, is different because we're doing a big band tunes for Christmas. But we really, what we really do, especially in, with this Christmas tour, is we take people back to the 1950s. And this wow. is this is how I I grew up. My dad was a World War II veteran, and when he came home, he was playing get Glenn Miller Orchestra uh, on the Victrola, you know, every day. So that's it. Really, is an old school Christmas. You know, and I uh, love it's it. not, that's the stage that we're that we're setting for this. Yeah, yeah it's uh, and yeah. you know, it's you got to know your audience, right? And right, uh, right. And our audience is uh, our, our audience is, is is that you know, it's back yeah. in back before uh, back before iPhones. <laughs> yeah, but you're taking them back to the Glenn Miller days, and and what a what a great. Uh, I mean, Glenn Miller was one of the best, and and the way he, uh, I mean. He, he was also uh, someone that I think a, a lot of Americans don't realize that he was in many ways uh, very heroic in terms of what he did for people in the military. So you're getting a lot of military people into your uh, into your shows as well. Yeah, we actually do a tribute. Uh, 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 oddly enough, that we're talking about this, we do a tribute to, uh, to to the military because I have all these pictures of my dad. He served. Uh, off the coast of Okinawa, um, and and you know, on an amphibious assault craft, yeah. which was the his craft, you know, guarded the uh, guarded the entire the, the fleet and the admiralty, and his job was we have pictures of him was to call in the artillery from the uh, from the ships from his ship to shoot down the Japanese zeros and the kamikaze pilots who were trying to kill him and everybody else, and so when he came back to Long Island, uh, and and I was born after after that. He was a he was a tough guy, you know, and he ran. If you remember the, the movie The Great Santini with with mm -hmm. Robert Duvall, who was a, a fighter pilot who ran his family like a, like a squadron. My, my dad did that. That was my dad. And so when when I wrote my book Relentless and I was talking about my my childhood, the publisher uh, they were writing a you know a promotional piece of promotional material, and in it, it said, well, John grew up in an abusive household. And I said, no, 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 no. that was the 1950s. <laughs> I said we got we. We got spanked, and we had to, and we we had to, we had timeouts in the basement, and our piano teachers hit our hands with a ruler. That 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 wasn't that wasn't abuse. That was our life. Uh, talk to me a little bit more about family life for a young John Tesh. Well, I mean, a lot of it. Uh, we always ate dinner, you know, around the dinner table, and now all of a sudden, they're you know, Berkeley and 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 Harvard have to do these studies on what happens to. Children, when they don't uh, they don't have dinner two or three times a week, what happens to their uh, learning ability? What happens to their uh, what happens to their emotional state? You know, but that was just the thing, is that you you know you just you, you always had dinner with your family and 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 you know my parents <laughs> my parents for the most part didn't even know where my school was. You know, <laughs> now it's got you got like helicopter parents. You remember these days? I mean, especially on Long Island where. You know, you, you come home from school and you, you get on your Stingray bicycle and you go out and or maybe you have soccer practice or something like that, and then your parents don't see you until the street lights come on. That's that was the that was the signal that you had to be you had to be home, or you were a latchkey kid like somebody like uh, Lin Manuel yeah. Miranda who talks about that. that it's, both his parents, both his parents work. So I hate to do the old the old guy thing of ah back in the days, but there's actually a speech that we do. Uh, on, I do. I wrote a poem uh, called uh, called Old School. I want an old school life, and and uh, and people are you know it's all you're know, talking about, you know they, back then we watched when they, when they walked on the moon, but there were no baristas, and uh, and and we you know we read books with uh, with uh, paper and 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 ink, uh, and uh, there was no it was you know it's it's a funny thing that I don't have it in front of me now. It's good. But, uh, it's good. But I think a lot of that stuff's coming back. You know, you see, you see records coming back. You see people that are now making mixtapes on on cassettes. Uh, people are, are buying dumb phones now. They're buying phones that don't go on the uh, on the internet. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, a lot of what we know is, uh, and, and, you yeah. know, it, sometimes uh, uh, you know, I, I tell a story about how I wrote this one song for the, for the NBA. I wrote it on my answering machine, so I have to put a, a picture of an answering machine up on the screen behind me because they're. People bring their grandkids. And they have no idea what I'm talking about. So it's like, okay, <laughs> here it is, and here's and here's how we had to use it. Use it. We made, we spent half the day trying to record the outgoing message. You know, all that stuff. Yeah. Talk to me about your show and what you're always striving to give people. I I left. I I was very blessed to to have a, a program on PBS called Live at Red Rocks. It was a music special. That was I great. Anybody yeah. to sign. I couldn't get anybody to sign me. 
uh, I worked for a record company because I was the guy that was reading celebrity birthdays on, on Entertainment Tonight. But I, w- I, I had grown up, you know, in, a, in the marching bands and in rock and roll bands, and I had classical training on the piano. But I was, a, I was, I was the TV guy, and so I always wanted to be considered a musician. And I, I saw Yanni, and uh, who became a friend, and three tenors, and and uh, and also the Moody Blues, and you too. They were the last two were were at, at Red Rocks, and I saw the public television special. I said, you know what, that's that's my key. That's my ticket. I'm going to do my songs with the Colorado Symphony uh, Orchestra. And I went to sell it to PBS, and they were like, "Yeah, but you don't have a you don't have a following musically. But if you make the special, then we'll maybe we'll test it." And so, my wife and I, you know, we took TV money and we invested in that thing, and uh, and it rained after four songs. And we we, yeah. we show this on, on our live concerts. It rained after four songs. The orchestra left. The rest of us ended up playing in the rain. The audience didn't leave because they were they were used to it, and and we're playing we're playing music as it's raining and we're just pouring out. And I, I know that I'm just going to lose all this uh, all this money, and the audience puts up their umbrellas, right? And and they're like they're like this. And so at the end of every song, there wasn't any applause because they only had one hand, and so, and so they were going like this, you know, with the umbrella for applause. And my bass player leans over and goes, "Hey, it's a Mary Poppins concert," you know. But uh, but but God intervened. The rain stopped. Orchestra came back. They tested the thing in Maryland, and within five days, gosh, we went from selling uh, 250 records a month to 50,000. And wow! My, and my music career was born, and and we ended up raising you know nearly wow. 10 million dollars for public television. So <clears throat> they're good friends. They're good friends of mine. They're good friends now. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're, 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 they're good friends. Uh, John, look, I appreciate you, man. I, I know you're busy. you got a lot going on. You've got your tour going on. In fact, I think you're coming to to Maryland, which is my home state, and I, I hope to peek in and see you. I think you're going to my hometown of Hagerstown, Maryland, at the Maryland Theater, and they need to treat you well there. And I know that they will because uh, that town loves you. But more importantly, I, I just got to ask you, my final question is, what's your hope? for America, given what we've been through and what we're going through right now, what's your hope for America? That, that after all that's going on and, rec- okay, so two things. One, recognize that the spirit of the air is real, that the devil is doing a dance right now, that he's loving all of this. Uh, and number two, understand that that everything that's in the Bible, the Word of God, is is true, and and that's really where our hope is. And when you dig in and you you land on certain scriptures, you're like, oh my gosh, this is the truth. There's too many of us uh, today who are trying to trying to change that, or, tr- or say, trying to say that the Bible isn't for today. But given what we're going through right now, if you just take a look you'll see that more than ever it, it is uh, for today. And that's the only weapon, the weapon of our warfare, that I believe is going to get us through this. John Tesh, much love to you, man, and respect for what you're doing. Thank you for being on America's Hope. So great hanging out with you again. Thank you. <laughs> My final word is this. We are merely moving shadows, and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. We heap up wealth not knowing who will spend it, and so... Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in God. And you, America. Thanks for watching America's Hope. Have a good night. God bless. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. Hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire No one else will do Nothing else can take your place To feel the warmth of your
your America and my America. United we stand, divided.